So I'm speaking today on behalf of a very large consortium. This is now 37 laboratories across four continents trying to understand antibodies not only against Ebola, but against a variety of emerging hemorrhagic fever viruses. So first I'll start with uh, the, the background of why we formed this consortium, then I'll show you the data that we have generated in the last year. So Ebola belongs to the family of filoviruses. Within the family of filoviruses, there's a genus of Ebola viruses, and there's a genus of Marburg viruses, and then there's another one. Within the Ebola virus genus, there's five different viruses, only one of which is actually called Ebola virus. All of these viruses are this long filamentous particle that you've seen on TV and they have only one molecule on their surface. That's a glycoprotein called GP. And GP is the only protein they have to attach to and drive themselves into host cells. So GP is the target of antibodies that would inactivate the virus. So my lab solved three crystal structures of filovirus GPs from Ebola virus, Sudan virus, which until last year caused the largest outbreak of Ebola hemorrhagic fever ever, and Marburg virus, each one of them in complex with a different neutralizing antibody. That one's warming up. So let me walk you through the first one so you can understand where the antibodies bind. So this is the core structure of the trimer on the surface of the virus. The blue and green subunits are called GP1. That's the attachment subunit. So that's like GP120 or HA1, if you're more familiar with HIV and flu. And white at the bottom is GP2. That's the fusion subunit. It's like GP140, I mean GP41. And it's wrapped around the outside of the fusion subunit, tying them together. Now, the fusion loop that actually penetrates the target cell membrane is not tucked up inside like you think you might be. Instead, it's slapped on the outside like a fly swatter. So in infection, this fusion loop will unwrap from the outside of the trimer and penetrate the target cell membrane. And then the two heptad repeats will collapse into a six helix bundle as it fuse viral and cell membranes together. So the view you're looking at is the side view where the viral membrane will be at the bottom and the target cell will be at the top. Now, on the upper and outer parts of the GP1 subunit is a domain we call the glycan cap. Now, I haven't drawn the glycans here, but there's four in a cluster in that one site. And attached further out from there are domains we call the mucin-like domains. So they're about 75 kilodaltons each. There's three. They're about 150 amino acids and a whole lot of n anolink sugars. These are quite flexible and quite disordered, and we can't crystallize any GP containing those domains. And they're not even quite visible by EM. So we've used another technique, which is small angle x-ray scattering to visualize them, which is this. So you have Ebola on the, your left and Marburg on the right. So you can see the mucin-like domains are these big blue elephant-like ear structures that extend upward and outward for Ebola and kind of down blocking the size from Marburg. We think that's real, and that reflects how the antibodies see the glycoproteins. But that whole blue cloud is kind of a disordered mess of protein and carbohydrate. And you can see how that might dominate host interaction surfaces, or even possibly antibody interaction surfaces. Here is the unusual thing about Ebola virus. So even though this, more or less, is what it looks like on the viral surface, this is not the version of the glycoprotein that binds the critical cellular receptor. Instead, what happens is that the virus is drawn in by macropenocytosis. Once the virus is inside the cell endosome, it is processed by human enzymes called cathepsins. And the job of cathepsins is to cut off those mucin-like domains and the glycan caps, leaving behind a minimal protein core. The top of the protein core is the receptor binding site, and that's conserved across the whole filovirus family. So that site for the Ebola viruses is only exposed once the virus is inside the endosome. It is otherwise blocked by those big clouds of proteoglycan, the mucin-like domains, and the glycan cap. So there's two very different manifestations of the GP in infection. There's this heavily glycosylated version, which is what's subject to immune surveillance. That's on the surface of the virus and the surface of infected cells. And then there's this tiny core, which does a job of receptor binding. But this only appears once the virus is inside the cellular endosome. And then for the Ebola viruses, there's also a dimeric version of the protein called SGP. And actually, 80% or more of the transcripts of the glycoprotein gene make this secreted dimer. So it's quite abundant in infection. 
and it may serve as a decoy. Certainly antibodies cross-react between SGP and GP, and it could serve as a sink, because there's at least five times as much of it as there is of GP. Okay, so what do all these different manifestations of the glycoprotein mean for the immune response? Well, the first thing is that some antibody target sites are lost once the virus gets inside the cell. You can generate antibodies against the mucin-like domain and the glycan cap, but many of those are simply cleaved off the virus by the cathepsins once it gets inside the endosome. So even if the virus has completely saturated those kinds of antibodies, they often don't neutralize because the human enzymes just cut them and their epitopes right off, leaving behind a perfectly functional receptor binding core. What you might really want to hit, which is that conserved essential receptor binding site, isn't so easy because it's not exposed on the viral surface. So if you, engineer, you can engineer an antibody against it, but you do have to target it to the endosome because it won't bind the virus and it won't neutralize whole virus. Okay, so what works? The first antibody that we ever saw that would neutralize Ebola virus well is this one. So this is the crystal structure of the Ebola virus GP trimer in complex with a human antibody called KZ52. So KZ52 is a yellow FAB fragment at the bottom. It was raised by Dennis Burton and Paul Perrin at Scripps in 1999. Now KZ52 has been clever. It's bypassed all that changing stuff at the top and instead it's firmly anchored itself to the bottom. It mostly binds white and a little bit of blue. So what it's done is it's anchored onto that fusion subunit and it's pre-fusion conformation and it keeps it from undergoing the conformational changes it would need to drive membrane fusion. And so that's how it neutralizes. Okay, what else neutralizes? This neutralizes. This is the crystal structure of the Sudan virus glycoprotein and complex with the only antibody known so far, published so far, to neutralize Sudan. That's called 16F6 and was raised at USAMRID by John Dye. And say 16F6 binds the same place as KZ52. So even though they're different against different viral species that are about 50% different in the glycoprotein sequence, and one's from an immunized mouse and one's from a naturally infected human, they found the same spot. So that's kind of a shared solution for neutralization of the Ebola virus genus, binding of the base. You'll see that again later in the talk. Now 16F6 hasn't yet been tried in primates, but KZ52 had. Even though it neutralizes really potently in vitro and is able to protect both mice and guinea pigs from lethal challenge with the virus, it was unable to protect the non-human primates. Now, at the time, that was the best antibody known against Ebola virus. So the field thought, if the best we have isn't good enough, does that mean there's any hope for antibodies against this virus. Maybe it replicates too quickly. Maybe the fact that a single viral particle can be a lethal dose for a primate means the antibodies aren't a good solution. So the field at the time wondered if that meant the antibody in general would not be effective, or maybe that neutralizing antibody wasn't enough, needed something else, or that one antibody delivered by itself wasn't enough, or maybe the primates needed another dose to knock the viral load down long enough for the immune system to take over. So that was what the field thought, and it was really difficult to get any funding at all to look at antibodies against Ebola virus. Now, thankfully, a couple of labs stayed alive. And around 2011, 2012, they all published independently that even though the one neutralizing antibody wasn't protective for non-human primates, mixtures were. And these, antibodies had, these, these labs had different mixtures. So one was enriched polyclonal sera, the others were cocktails and monoclonals. So what are these cocktails that do protect non-human primates? Well, this is the first one we looked at. This is called MBO03, and it was raised by USAMRID. It's three monoclonals. You've got crystal structures of two and a single particle EM of the third. These antibodies are directed against a linear epitope in the mucin domain, a different linear epitope in the mucin domain, and the glycan cap. So these antibodies are directed against the parts of the glycoprotein that are cut off, the parts that are removed once it gets into the endosome. They don't neutralize at all for the two mucin ones, or very well for the glycan cap in vitro. But you put the three together, and they were protective in non-human primates. And so that was a bit of a puzzle. Did that mean, well, what we had at the time was this antibody, which gave us potent neutralization, but no protection of non-human primates. And we had this combination, which gave us protection in the absence of any decent neutralization. So did that mean that binding the bottom was wrong and binding the top was right in some way that we didn't understand? 
Or did it mean that this was delivered all by itself and this was a cocktail of three? The idea that maybe you just needed a cocktail came from the set of data we had. The one KZ-52 by itself didn't offer protection. The group that put two monoclonals together got partial protection. The two groups that put three monoclonals together got complete protection. Now you can't directly compare these because they're given at different doses and different time points, but at the simplest possible level, does this set of results mean that you just need a cocktail? Do you just need three? And so this is what we thought at the time. This is 2012, this is two years before the outbreak. Do you just need a cocktail? And if you need a cocktail, how many antibodies go in? Is the magic number three, or if you found two that were potent enough, would that suffice or would four be better? And here's the most important question, how are we going to pick them? You cannot begin in primates, you'd like to begin somewhere else, but in vitro neutralization was not giving us the right answer all the time. So how are we going to pick these? We'd like to do this in some kind of high throughput way in an inexpensive plastic format. And if this data is telling us that we need a cocktail, we want antibodies that work well together, that have some additive or maybe synergistic function, not ones that compete. So how will we know what binds where? So there are nested sets of questions in there, and it was a, some of them are fairly complex. Now I'm a structural biologist, and I had a lot of antibodies in my lab they were using to try to make crystal contacts to solve the structures of the GP. So we had a pretty clear roadmap in our head of where the different antibodies were binding. And what I thought was that maybe we don't understand these questions because we don't have a large enough sample size. I've shown you four structures. Maybe you can't make any general conclusions from four antibodies. Maybe we need a bigger pool. And so this is what we formed. This is the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium. It's an open collaboration to the entire field. We're now 37 labs. Uh, nearly everybody in the field has joined. And the goal is to gather everybody's antibodies and to blind them, give them all code names so nobody knows whose antibodies they're working at with. And we're just going to all together from this very large pool of monoclonals figure out what works and why. Which epitopes are most efficacious? How can we predict what's going to work in primates? And how you can put together the best cocktails for treatment? Maybe what we're looking for are needle in a haystack antibodies. And maybe the right combination could be one from Tokyo and one from San Diego and one from Paris. And you'd never know unless they're all in the same room together. This is how they get in the same room together. And because all the antibodies are de-identified, it's very fair. Everybody's doing their own kind of analysis, and we're just going to agree on what the data says is best. Now, we have three different projects. The first one is to look at antibodies against Ebola virus. The second one, fill in what we're neat and missing for all the other filoviruses. And the third one are the endemic arena viruses, like Lassa virus, Lujo virus, and others in South America. So let me show you the data for Ebola virus today. And it'll give you an idea of the timeline. Let me go back. So we had this idea in 2012, this is two years before the outbreak. We wrote the grant, it was, this is the normal NIH timeline, scored in 2013, the money started March 2014. Patient zero, the two-year-old boy in Guecadu province in Guinea was infected a, a couple months earlier. So the outbreak was already going on when this project started. Now we thought we'd go about this two different ways, kind of a tortoise and hare strategy. The tortoise strategy is to just do it properly, get all the antibodies we could, blind them all, do a, a multidisciplinary analysis from all these different labs, figure out what works and why, and put together the best cocktails we can. These might be good therapeutics, certainly they're good research benchmarks going forward. Now, two of the members of my team, Larry Zeitlin and Gary Kobinger, said, well, that's a great idea. That's going to take a couple of years. What if there's an outbreak? What if we need something faster? Remember, they had that thought in 2012. And so they devised the hair strategy. The hair strategy was to take those two, three monoclonal cocktails, MBO03 and ZMAB, uh, USAMRID and Canada, and just take that little pool of six antibodies and just mix and match those. And all we were going to do was solve structures and put different combinations in primates. So all we knew about those when we started, we had the structures of MBO03, and we knew the names of the ones that Canada had picked out to put in ZMAP. We had no structural information. ZMAP turned out to be two from Canada and one from RID, and it offered complete protection of primates even five days after exposure to lethal dose. Now in this animal model, those primates typically die around day seven or eight. So these are some very, very sick animals and it was able to protect all of them. So that was very exciting results. Now this is the structure of what ZMAP looked like. This is single particle EM done by Andrew Ward's lab at the Scripps Research Institute. The glycoprotein trimer is the gray 
cup in the center. And then there's three FAB fragments from ZMAP. There's 13C6, which blinds, binds the glycan cap up at top. It doesn't neutralize very well in cell culture. Its job is probably to recruit immune effector functions. And there's these two, which come from the Canadian lab, Gary Copinger's lab, 4G7 and 2G4. These bind the bottom. They bind exactly the same place where KZ52 and 16F6 bind, and they're all affected by the same point mutation. And they do neutralize. In fact, they were chosen for the Canadian cocktail based upon their ability to neutralize. So maybe the first thing the ZMAP is telling us is that neutralization is important, but maybe you also need the thing at the top. And maybe the, the reason why KZ52 didn't work is it was all by itself. Maybe it wasn't so much that binding the bottom was wrong and binding the top was right, but this is pretty good. Binding that side is also necessary, and maybe now we can throw out those mucin ones. They're quite susceptible to escape. Now, I'm showing you it drawn this way, with the green and, antibody, green and yellow antibodies bound to different monomers in the GP trimer. But the biophysics also tells us this, that they bind the same site and they compete with each other, leaving open the possibility that these are effectively the same antibody doing the same thing. So ongoing research is going to tell us if we really need all three of these. One does not express as well, nor does it neutralize as well or protect as well. Maybe we could just throw it out and have a much simpler cocktail to manufacture. If you're going to throw out that antibody and maybe replace it with something else to mitigate mutagenic escape, what would you pick? Well, that would be probably an antibody from the tortoise track. So let me show you the data we have from the first year and a half of what happens when essentially the entire field gets together to figure out what works. So we asked all the, an the laboratories in the Ebola virus field to send us their best antibodies, ones that they thought worked in whatever assay they were doing. And so we collected 160 from 37 different labs. Some of them are from immunized mice. Others are actually from, the, are from human survivors, either of the 1995 Kikowitz Zaire outbreak. A lot of them are now 2014 survivors. Some of the survivors were people that received ZMAP. Some of the survivors are people that didn't receive ZMAP. So we have a whole range of different things. We got them all together. We did some standardization in my lab and quality control. We blinded all the samples, and we packed identical boxes of the world's antibodies and sent them out to all the different labs in the field for everybody to do their own kind of analysis. People are doing different kinds of neutralization, immune effector function analysis, all kinds of different studies. And then we meet in San Diego once a year to put the data back together. What I'm going to show you first is mapping of the epitopes by biochemistry, structural biology, and alanine scanning. This is three labs working together, mine, Andrew Ward's, and then Ben Durant's company, Integral Molecular. So this is Ebola GP in a ribbon model. Let me show you the different parts so you see where the antibodies bind. You got the mucin domain up at top, glycan cap right underneath. At the center is the rest of GP1, the core. At the very bottom, in red, that's the base. That's where KZ52 and two-thirds of ZMAP bind. There's a fusion loop stuck on the outside, like this. And then there's the rest of GP2. You see the first heptad repeat coiling around GP1, and the other one dangles down below. It's disordered. We don't see it, but we know it's there. OK, this is where the antibodies bind. We found 17 against the mucin-like domain, 22 against the glycan cap, 8 against the base. So KZ52 and ZMAP are in this pool somewhere. I'm still blinded. And so there's others in the field that do the same thing and bind the same place. They're all um, susceptible to the same mutation. There's 24 against the core that also cross-react to SGP, 13 against the core that do not, and 29 we couldn't quite figure out by ELISA, so they bind something quaternary. The first thing we did was use electron microscopy and alanine scanning to pick apart those unknown epitopes and find out where they bind. So these three turn out to bind the fusion loop. So this is the GP trimer in white, single particle EM of VIC number 16, Binding on the fusion loop, you can see its um, footprint in hot pink. So that's the first time we've ever seen an anti-fusion loop antibody from this blinded pool that was out there in the field but hadn't been mapped. Here's VEC26. Binds the same kind of place but shifted over a little bit. And these results map really well to the alanine scanning. So this is from Integral Molecular, and they find that an I527 alanine mutation knocks out VIC26, and it's smack dab in the middle of the footprint found by EM. VIC-12 turned out to bind the glycan cap, but at a different orientation from anything we'd seen before. So it's down lower, and it matches the alanine scanning from integral molecular. 
These four were found to bind to the, bind to the second heptad repeat that's below the GP2 structure. So you can see they down, bind down below the core. Okay, so this is the array of where they bind and what we've figured out so far. The first question we would ask is which ones neutralize in cell culture? Now we're doing this a couple of different ways because we wanted to see which neutralization assay might be more protective or, or predictive than any other. So we're looking at GP on the surface of vesicular stomatitis virus. We're looking at Ebola virus particles minus one gene so they can be grown in a BSL-3 instead of BSL-4. And we're looking at BSL-4 micronutralization. So we're looking at single and multi-round assays with and without complement. We're also looking at what mutations arrive to escape. Essentially, all the NUT data agrees. No matter how you do the different assay, a strong neutralizer is a strong neutralizer. If you get down to the very weak neutralizers, some assays pick them up, others don't. But the strong is strong. And so you can roughly bin the antibodies into three categories. Here are all the VIC antibodies that neutralize potently, under strong, moderately, and weakly. If you color code them by epitope and slot them back in the grid, you see this. Whoops. So, you have the VIC number, and then some of them have a letter, M, S, or W, strong, moderate, or weak. Some epitopes are much more likely to have neutralizing effect than others. So the first question we're going to ask is, does its ability to neutralize correlate with where it binds? Are some epitopes more effective in neutralization? And that's true. If you look at the base, they almost all neutralize. If you look at the second hep heptat repeat, they all neutralize. The fusion loop, they all neutralize. The glycan cap, precious few. The mucin-like domain, none. So some epitopes more consistently lead to neutralization in any kind of assay. And all of those epitopes are on the bottom half of GP. Now that makes a lot of sense because the top half remodels itself and much of it is lost once it gets into the endosome. So binding the bottom and preventing the conformational changes required for infection makes a lot of sense why these just mechanically neutralize the virus. Okay, here's the important question though. Does neutralization in vitro correlate with protection in vivo? Now, what we've done here is use the mouse model. Because we have 160 antibodies, we couldn't go right into primates. And so this mouse model is sort of the standard in the field as a first step. What we have done, though, is a little bit more of a stringent assay. Instead of looking at the ability of the antibodies to protect mice one day after challenge, we're looking at the ability to protect mice two days after challenge. And so we see some antibodies not protecting that were previously shown to protect at one day. So we're looking at a little bit of a higher bar than what's been seen before. So each of the VIC antibodies uh, was put into 10 mice. We can rank order them by what protects. So one protects completely. There's a lot that don't protect at all. They're all listed here. I'm going to make an arbitrary cutoff at 50% and call 50% partial protection. If you color code the antibodies that protect in the mouse model by epitope, and you slot them back in the grid, you get this array. So the VIC number is first. So if you look in the, the say, the red column, VIC 80 gives 100% protection. So the lesson we get is that you can get partial protection anywhere. Every single epitope has at least one antibody that gives partial protection, but some more consistently protect than others. So you can get protection anywhere, but there are some antibodies that are good against that site and some that are not so good against that site. Now, if you pick apart the data, you get a little more information. First of all, the ones that bind the base, like KZ52 and two-thirds of ZMAP, consistently protect. Every single one of them gives at least 50 percent. One gives complete protection. But back to the question in the field, and the reason why we wanted to do this kind of study at scale is does neutralization correlate with protection? Meaning, does neutralization in vitro in these assays that we've done correlate with protection in that mouse model that the field has been using for so long? Well, sometimes it does. So there are 71 antibodies of the 110 for which I have the mouse data so far that neither neutralize nor protect. They're just no good. And if you'd thrown them out on the basis of their failure to neutralize, you would have done the right thing. Okay, here are 16 out of 110 antibodies that both neutralize and protect. But sometimes neutralization and protection don't correlate. Here are 10 antibodies that neutralize, but they don't protect. And some of them neutralize quite potently. There's a lot of S's, meaning very potent neutralization. And we don't know why it is that they're not protective in the mouse model. 
But that suggests to me that mechanical neutralization isn't enough. We need something else, probably immune effector function. On the other half of the coin are the six antibodies that give some in vivo protection, but they don't neutralize. So you wouldn't have picked these out if you're doing in vitro neutralization assays alone, but we're getting 50 to 70% protection in the mouse model. And among those that both neutralize and protect, you can't predict the level of protection from the potency of neutralization. For example, if you look at the base, here are three that all give you 50% protection, so equivalent mouse protection, but you have two strong neutralizers and one weak neutralizer. Now, these bind all the same epitope. And in the middle, we have two that give moderate protection. One neutralizes potently, one not at all for some reason. And among the three most potent, two of them neutralize only moderately. So eight antibodies is not a large sample size, but eight separate ones against the same epitope does give you some interesting things to look at. So does neutralization correlate with protection? The answer is that sometimes, and in some places, but how well it neutralizes in vitro doesn't tell you how well it will protect in vivo. And neutralization alone is not enough. We have some potent neutralizing antibodies that are not protective, and we need to understand why. Some of those antibodies that apparently don't neutralize must be getting by on something else, probably immune effector function alone. So this gives us an opportunity to figure out what are those immune effector functions, and can we engineer the FC that we want and the FAB we want to make the kind of antibody that we want. Now, what the field is doing based on that first body of data is this. Immune effector looks pretty important. So Galit Alter for us is doing a, an array of many different types of assays looking at all the different immune effector functions that an antibody might bring. And because we just put out a broad call for all antibodies in the field that people thought looked good in whatever assays they were doing, we get a variety of species and we get a variety of subclasses. And the immune effector functions as you can imagine, do cluster by what the species of the antibody was and what a subclass was. But they also cluster a bit by epitope, so that's kind of interesting, and that's something that we need to try to tease apart and understand better. But if you look at the most interesting set, these are the antibodies that neutralize but don't protect, and the antibodies that protect but don't neutralize, and you try to understand what the differences are in immune effector. You can look at some different assays, and we look, you can look in mouse cells, and you can look at human cells, so you don't find any strong correlation until this one, antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, there's a difference between how they behave in mouse cells and how they behave in human cells. So the white circle antibodies, those that are protective in the mouse model in the absence of neutralization, are conferring that function in mouse cells, and that probably contributes to their protection. But note that they don't consistently have a difference in human cells. And so the fact that the field has been using this mouse model for decades may mean that we're looking at misleading results. We're looking at antibodies that protect a mouse, and they may not be bringing in the same immune effector functions as those that are ultimately going to protect a human. And so this data that the consortium is generating is telling us that we probably need to look at a different model, maybe those mice populated with human um, FC receptors. So what else we're doing now is we've taken our initial pool of 160, and we've narrowed it down to 20 that look good. And the, the looking good could be potent in vivo protection or potent neutralization, ideally both, and one or two that are unique epitopes. And we're taking the FCs and we're modifying them to see if we can get different kinds of immune effector functions. So take an FAB that we want and give it different FC species and subclasses. We're looking into trying different animal models to see if changing animal model will give you greater predictive efficacy. Because tr traditionally what has happened in the filovirus field is they go into mice, if they work in mice, they go into guinea pigs. If they work in guinea pigs, they go into non-human primates. If they go into non-human primates, it might get put into a human compassionately in a Hail Mary pass. But if you think about consistently what confers protection in all of those different species that have different immune effector function and different FC receptors, the least common denominator is mechanical neutralization. And so just mechanical neutralization might be what's progressing down the line. There may very well have been some antibodies that would have been protective in primates, but they wound up on the cutting room floor because they didn't protect mice. If they don't protect mice, I don't think they've ever been moved forward to the higher cost of primate studies. 
So the other thing we're trying to do, now that we've taken the field's antibodies, we figured out which ones are most potent or most protective, uh, we're putting together novel cocktails that are ones that we haven't seen before, that weren't possible until we had everybody's all in the same place, and we're testing those. And we're also looking within this pool for ones that are cross-reactive, because we've now spent millions of dollars coming up with vaccines and antibody therapeutics against one of the filoviruses. But for Ebola virus to suddenly appear in West Africa when it had never been there before was unexpected. All filovirus outbreaks are pretty much unexpected. What if we have vaccines and therapeutics and everything we need for Ebola virus, but it's Sudan or Marburg that pop up next and we've got nothing? Well, that's not going to work. So we're looking for antibodies that, we, that are going to be cross-protective. Our next big project also is Marburg virus. So as this Ebola panel winnows down and goes in, into different animal models, we're now tr putting out a call for the field for antibodies against Marburg virus. So we can do the same kind of blinded analysis. Marburg's the most disparate from Ebola virus. They're 70% different at the amino acid level. And their glycosylated domains are stuck on in different places. And so the antibodies tend to bind different sites. So let me show you what I mean. These are the SACS models of the fully glycosylated glycoproteins for Ebola and Marburg. You can see if I have Ebola, the mucin domains are attached up here. And for Marburg, they're attached down here with sort of a similar shaped core at the center. That means that really potent neutralizing antibodies, like the base binders, find a site on Ebola viruses. But that receptor binding site up at top is blocked by the glycan cap that sits right in it in the mucin-like domain. Whereas for Marburg virus, that base is blocked. It's got a piece of the mucin domain stuck right on the spot where KZ52 would otherwise bind. And we have never seen a base binder yet for Marburg virus. However, the receptor binding site at the top is now exposed. And we do have panels of neutralizing antibodies that bind up there. So for Ebola viruses, we see things that look like KZ52 at the bottom. There's eight of them in the VIC panel. And for Marburg virus, and this is a panel of antibodies from a human survivor in Colorado raised by James Crow, we see a lot of potent neutralizing antibodies that bind the top. Some of them will cross-react among all the different filoviruses. But to bind the site in Ebola viruses, you have to remove the glycan cap and the mucin-like domain. So there's some engineering involved. So we think we're going to find different kinds of antibodies for Marburg virus. And if any of you have antibodies against that panel and you would like to contribute them to the study, please do. Everything remains blinded. And it only gets unblinded with the investigator's permission. And so the papers might be published as VIC-12 does this and VIC-32 does that. And in general, antibodies bind here or there. And, and the hope is you could come up with a more effective cocktail from this greater pool than you could from any one antibody together. So these are the people involved in the consortium. If they haven't asked, there's the ones that did the experiments that I've showed you today. And I especially like to thank NIAID for supporting the scale of this study. These are the people that did the experiments meeting in San Diego in September to put the data back together. And here they're spelling out VIC. It's like YMCA, but the costumes aren't as good. So that's the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. You sort of went, glossed over a little bit the role of uh, human and mouse FC domains in the antibodies. I mean, what you're saying makes absolute sense, but do you have any data that indicates the importance of, or, or is there other data published indicating the importance of human FCs when used in mice and uh, not working? Well, if you, if you take apart the ones that are in the VIC panel, the human IgG1 works much better than any mouse IgG1. And when people have dis traditionally in the field discovered antibodies by immunizing mice, they just, as a first step, re-engineered it and put on a human FC. And so what we'd like to look at are uh, data on the same antibodies engineered a lot of different ways and see what really what is the difference. And some of the people in the consortium have put in that same FAB, but with different glycans on the FC. And so we don't have all that data yet. The initial data we do have is exactly what you'd expect. But mouse IgG2A and human IgG1 work very well. I'm, I'm wondering if you looked at the uh, pharmacokinetics of different antibodies and how that might contribute to different uh, uh, protective properties in, in vivo. That's a great suggestion. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but I think that's going to be important. And I think that's something that Matt Bio has been looking at with their, their, their cocktails. We just haven't done it at the scale of this yet. But I, I think that's a very important question. 
That was a great talk. Hi. So I just wanted, do we know whether the, mo the monkey model is a good model for human infection? So, I mean, with all the species differences, do we know what model to test is in and which one is going to be the most protective? Right, so is uh, the monkey model the most yeah. effective? That's a really good question. It's much better than the guinea pig or the mouse. Um, I, I think we don't know because we haven't had enough infected humans and those that have received antibody cocktails have also gotten medical care at Emory or Nebraska. And so we don't really know. There's a human trial ongoing with ZMAM, so when that data is revealed, we should know. But we don't, no one's ever done those studies, and so we don't know. Um, certainly I have, and I'm a structural biologist, but I, I, that's certainly data that we need because we have to test them somehow. Do you have any indication that uh, the affinity or affinity of the antibodies are important? And I was wondering because you hear in th these days a lot about bispecific antibodies, and I'm thinking like when you have found a combination, would you envision that maybe by putting it in a bispecific format that you would get greater potency? Mm -hmm. Okay, affinity, avidity, and bispecificity. By specificity. Um, affinity is important in that if it doesn't bind well, it won't work well, but there are many that bind very tightly and are not protective. So it helps, but it's not the only thing. Um, I think avidity is important. If you look at composition gradient multi-angle light scattering of the different antibodies, you can see some that exhibit cooperative binding, and they tend to be more protective <coughs> than ones that do not exhibit cooperative binding. So that is something important. We're adding in that study on the VIC panel. I think bispecificity is a really good idea. Some of that is being done by John Lai and Albert Einstein. Um, he's done some of it to make things that are cross-reactive, so an Ebola side and a Sudan side. But I think that that's also a really good strategy for targeting things to the endosome. And so that's a level of engineering that I think we could definitely do given this panel of, of reagents that we have. Over here. So, uh, my question goes back to, uh, the first, to the first question. So uh, it seems that you need a cocktail, you need uh, neutralizing antibodies and maybe an antibody with effective functions. So when you guys are gonna engineer um, <coughs> the FC part of the antibody that binds to a murine-like region, so maybe you, you will know if an effective function is important. But do you know if you know, the antibody who binds to a murine domain will introduce uh, a conformational change that will make it easier for neutralizing anybody to neutralize, yes or no? It's certainly possible, and uh, we think we have some initial evidence that some of the antibodies might enhance others' binding. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might be something you would look at just to see if, if you want to not give your antibodies all together, but give them a different order, or that helps you pick out what cocktail you should have. But, so we don't have all that data, but that's something we'd like to look at. This Sorry. is kind of a big picture question, because I was really impressed, not just with the content of the talk, but the success you had around uh, the experiments you did. Let me be more specific. You were able to find out that neutralization didn't correlate with potency or the effect in humans, and that mouse didn't predict uh, what happened in a human either, and it seems Well, we haven't really done experiments in humans. We just didn't put, this is the only protection of my, mice. Really. I understand. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, it seems like you were able to pull this off because you had a consortium that was just generating a whole bunch of data, and you saw these patterns emerge. The small lab would just, you know, go through common sense. If it neutralizes, it must be good. Right. Which is not necessarily the case. What does a small lab do? I mean, this is all you know, BS stuff, but what does a small lab do to be able to pull off what you did? <laughs> um, you know, and not get blinded by preconceived notions of outcomes, because we all do that. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and we even go on, if push comes to shove, we pick the one that neutralizes more potently because we can, and we know that mechanical neutralization is going to be probably consistent across the species. And I don't know, we're really stuck. Um, my hope is that we'll, by, by taking apart immune effector functions in different species cell types, we might find some combination that's yeah. helpful and, and find, because we really need some kind of fast, cheap, high throughput assay in plastic to predict what's going to work. So the small labs are doomed. No. <laughs> no. no, I'm just in saying fact, that because I think it's funny. Well, so 
there were 17 that both neutralized and protected, and then another 17 that were either neut or protect, and six that were not. So there's half and half. And so had you just picked their most potent neutralizers, you, you probably would have come up with something good. Um, we just cast the broad agnostic question because we could. Yeah. I all, think, right, I, I, all right, go ahead. I think the real answer to your question is that you join Erica's consortium. And then yes, <laughs> please do. In fact, this only works because we have 37 labs antibodies all in the same thing, and it's very fair. And that everybody is doing the same analysis on the same box of antibodies. And so everybody agrees on what it's showing and why. Okay, thanks very much, Erica. Thank you. Um,